Hello friends, this is Dave Hurwitz, Executive Editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with an absolutely stupendous box set from Naxos. Now, Naxos is not a label known for doing big boxes of things, although it has a few, but the ones it has done have been very, very interesting and often extraordinarily fine. There was the Dvorak Complete Published Orchestral Works, the Villa Lobos Symphonies, the Barber Box, we've talked about some of these, the Grieg Box, and a lot of these Naxos boxes are very, very nicely put together. They're well packaged, they're sturdy, they come with intelligent booklet notes, they're really a very fine examples of how to do it without any sacrifice in quality. And the box in question here, which I think is simply extraordinary, is the Naxos Early Music Collection. Now this was such a smart thing to do because Naxos has tons and tons and tons of early music. In fact, there's tons of early music everywhere and organizing it is a good idea. In fact, organizing it in this way as a kind of compendium of early music styles and practices and idioms is a fantastic sampler. I mean, it just gives you everything you need to know about what was happening before the Baroque period, or really up to the Baroque period. And once you know that, with the samples of materials that you have in here, you can either get more, because most of them are parts of a series, or you can just go off on your own and explore individual composers or individual eras. And this has 30 CDs, and it's very inexpensive. 30 CDs, it comes in one of these very, very nice, intelligently made boxes. It's sturdy, it's not all dented and crushed. It doesn't fall apart. It has, you know, some body to it. And you get this, this really decent booklet with notes by, I think they're by Keith Anderson, a very extended essay on, on all of the music in, in the box, including an excellent timeline. Look at this, which is really very helpful. You know, sometimes, sometimes all you need is a calendar to tell you when things happened. So here it is, and it gives you the whole history of the, of the main currents in early music, and then you have 30 discs. Now, the only issue with this is that it is, you know, 99% vocal music, and it does not come with texts and translations. I assume that most of these are available. Yes, for the full list of early music titles on the Naxos label, download the PDF file. Well, there's a PDF file, um, which gives you catalogs. And I assume also that you can get most of the texts and translations if you want them. Um, I think that that's probably worth seeking out if you can get it. But that aside, for the money, you just cannot beat it. And the performances are all very, very fine. I mean, they're, they're top quality. That's one of the things that Naxos was able to do extremely well from the beginning because early music ensembles have simply proliferated in the past few decades. And, and so many of them are excellent and they're looking for record labels. You know, there's only room for one or two on the major labels. And, and so it's, there's plenty of first class groups that are willing to record for Naxos, um, even though at the time a lot of these recordings were made, Naxos had not yet acquired the cachet that it has now as a label of the highest and best quality, because it really is. It, <laughs> at least is at least as highest and best as anything else out there today. And a lot of these recordings were, were uh, you know, instrumental in helping to build that reputation. So what is in the box? I have seven musical samples here that we're going to be listening to, and we're just gonna go through all 30 discs, and I'll let you know what you got. So let's start at the beginning. Here we go, here's the first pile. Okay, you gotta start with Gregorian chant, and so, of course, you get a disc of Gregorian chant. Notice these are all original, original jackets, you get the original covers, and they come in nice little sturdy cardboard sleeves. And the way this is done is just so much, so much better than some of the, the, the junk tossed out by the majors. It's fascinating how Naxos is able to do this. All right, so it's Gregorian chant with the Nova Scola Gregoriana under Alberto Turco. And I have to say, I mean, you know, there are, I, I know there are people who specialize in Gregorian chant, 
Yeah, and they specialize in whether it's done according to this tradition or that tradition or does this or it uses musica ficta or it's ficta isn't musica. They, oh my goodness, the amount of hysteria and argument that can appear on the issue of Gregorian chant. I don't care. It all sounds like chant to me. I mean, I'm not an expert. All I know is that I want it to sound chant-like and I want it to be in tune. And this does and it is. So that's disc one. Disc two. Oh! Hildegard of Bingen. We gotta have Hildegard. Now Hildegard lived from from 1098 to 1179, and she is one of the the most important and best known of all medieval composers. And she was a composer, even though her music is in the chant style. It's all original music. She was a major composer, and we have her music. Thank God. And a fascinating character she was. She was known as the Sybil of the Rhine. People came to her for advice and stuff. And she was an author and a physician and an abbess. And presumably she wrote this music for her sisters in the abbey to sing. It's all sacred music. It's incredibly beautiful. And I'm going to play you a little bit of Ave Generosa. Yes, it's gorgeous beautiful chant-like music. And let's listen to a little Hildegard to get us starting in the 11th century. Holy mackerel. We're going back to the 11th century. Beautiful, isn't it? That was performed, by the way, by the Oxford Camerata under Jeremy Summerley, who do quite a bit of this stuff. And they're very, very good. You know, one of the reasons that Western music is so fabulous, and I have to say this, I know right now in this day and age, we're supposed to, you know, not say that Western music is fabulous or anything Western is fabulous, but I'm not going there. It's fabulous, or we wouldn't be here. But one of the things that makes it fabulous is the fact that it's notated that Western music has a tradition of notated music, as opposed to improvised music, that goes back, well, a thousand years or more, a little bit more. And what's more, that notation, although it has minor differences in detail, is basically readable by any musician anywhere who knows the Western musical tradition. I mean, it's it's a consistent style of notation that that, that basically took over all of Europe rather quickly in the Middle Ages and went on to become the kind of music that we know and love today. But it is an amazing thing to have a written musical tradition. Um, it's something that most other world cultures do not share to the same degree and with the same consistency over such a long period. And I have no problem at all taking full credit for that as a lover of Western music and participant in the glories of Western civilization. So let's hear it for us. Yes. Now, uh, next we get, uh oh, look at this, music of the troubadours. Now we all know who the troubadours were. They were, they were guys who ran around writing poetry and singing about love. And one of the cool things about the music of the troubadours and and like stuff, and I'll play you, I'm gonna play you a little bit of it, is that is that we realize that from the earliest days of history, and this is this is coming from, well, you know, like the the twelfth and thirteenth centuries in that area, is that songs are songs. They have been the same since the day they were invented. <clears throat> they were all, I want you, babe, I need you, babe. I can't have you, babe. I'm miserable, babe. It's all the same thing. It's all about babe. 
or the lack thereof. <laughs> and and however the poet, poetic idiom may have changed or whatever language it's in, it's all about love, mostly about women because they were mostly written by men. And that's what it is. That's what it is. So you get a disc of stuff by troubadours. That's a lot of fun. And then we get um, Neatheart. Now, Neatheart is one of the troubadours who's actually a, a, a mini singer, mini singer, which was a German troubadour, effectively, um, and he, whose name we know and whose music we have. And so here's a collection of it. His, his music and his dance pieces, his instrumental pieces. One of the things this collection is going to do is take us through the rise of instrumental music. Because in back in the day, this guy's day, instrumental music was basically vocal music that was just played by instruments. That is, you could take a song and play it instrumentally. You, if it had multiple parts, you could assign any number of them to voices or instruments. And that's the way things were really up until about the Baroque period. So, so this is Neatheart with the, the, the Els Janssen's Van Master Baptiste Romaine, somebody directed by, by Mark Luan or Levon, or I, I'm not going to be able to pronounce any of these people. They're all Capella somethings or, or Scola somethings or something, something early musicensis or, you know, he'll just take my word for it. So that's a camarada of somewhere and who cares. Okay, next, some of the original songs from Carmina Burana. You know, we all know Carl Orff's Carmina Burana, but the original collection, which dates from about 1250-ish, they think, um, actually consists of poems with tunes, not always connected to each other, but poems with tunes. And so you can actually sing the original poems to the original melodies, none of which Orff used, by the way. So I'm going to play on this collection, there's only one that Orff borrowed. It was uh, Tempus es Jucundum. Now you know that one from Carmina Baran. It's, it's from the all the way at the end, just before Dulcissime and the final return of O Fortuna. You know, it goes, Tempus es Jucundum, Tempus es Jucundum, oh, 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 blah, 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 you know that one. And then it goes, oh, 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 totus flore, yo, yam amore virginali, totus ardeo, yo, novus, novus, novus amores, quoperio, quoperio. It's lots of fun. Well, this one is also quite rowdy, but it doesn't sound anything like Carl Orff's. So here is the the um, oh I, an ensemble unicorn. I can say that, and like other people, with the ensemble Oni Oni Winters something I whatever it is. Here is Tempus Est Jucundum. Original Carmina Burana. And so disc six now is Guillaume de Machot. And we have to play a bit of this. Why? Because Guillaume de Machot was the first composer who we know of to write a complete polyphonic mass that has survived. And polyphonic masses are really important. The polyphonic mass was the symphony of the period. You know how we like symphonies, right? The highest form of orchestral music in some respects. Well, the highest form of contrapuntal music was the mass setting. So the mass was the symphony. Motets were like overtures and symphonic poems. And then there were songs were always songs. And so the fact that we have this mass, this is like the first symphony ever of the period. And my show lived 
from 1300 to 1377. He also wrote songs, and uh, some of those are included on this lovely disc, again with Jeremy Summerlee and the Oxford Camerata. But here's a little bit, here's a little bit of the Ozana from the Sanctus of the, of the Notre Dame Mass, and it's really quite Quite an extraordinary thing. That was not the Ozana. They were doing that later. This is the Gloria. I'm sorry. This is the Gloria of the Notre Dame Mass. Notice the dissonances, the clashing harmonies. It's very, very interesting music. Very, very alien because harmonic practice had not yet settled down to the definitive tonal scale that we do now. The result has a primal quality that's very, very, very fascinating and captivating. So here you go. Yes, part of the Gloria from the Notre Dame Mass of Guillaume de Machaut. Next, there is a disc called Argentum et Aurum, Silver and Gold, Musical Treasures from the Early Habsburg Renaissance with Ensemble Leonis and Mark Luan, again, once again. And this is all kinds of early stuff by famous like early guys, including our friend Neidhart, who was, who was there in Heinrich Isaac and and, um, oh, let's see, who else is in here? Anonymous. A lot of this music is anonymous. It's a very nice collection of stuff from, from that period. And one of the nice things about this early music universe, actually, is that you get, you get specific discs dedicated to, you know, the court of so-and-so, where the arts flourished, you know, where the, the troubadours gathered, where the artists went. Um, and there were certain certain courts where things went well until the monarch died and some jackass took over who only wanted to either make babies or make war or do both. So anyway, that was that. Then we have Ah Guillaume Dufay. Dufay was another one of the great, great, great composers of the period, 1397 to 1474. This is a collection of chansons. In other words, songs. Lovely, lovely songs. He was a great songwriter, famous, famous songwriter. So that's fun to have. I mean, you really get a sense of that. And then, ah, Johannes Aukegum, one of the, the great, great exponents of the Flemish school, which was based in France, Belgium, the Netherlands, that part of the universe. And Aukegum was was known as a tremendous, tremendously gifted singer and composer and theorist as well. And this is his, his Requiem. He was one of the first composers who did a setting of the Requiem that we actually has come down to us. And also his Missa Prolationem, which is one of the most fascinating and complex contrapuntal works ever to e emerge from the head of humankind. And I'm not really going to get into why that is. All it means is that is that the basic motives go through all the voices in this kind of circular concept at every pitch level. And it, 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 it does a lot of counterpoint. Very beautiful music. Wonderful, wonderful music. You should have Akegum. You should have a disc of it. So here you go. Now we have music from the Eaton Choir Book. The Eaton Choir Book is English polyphony which was quite different from European polyphony. It was characterized by gorgeously high flowing soprano lines. We're going to get to more of that in a bit. And the Eaton Choir book has, is one of the largest, if not the largest collection of, of sort of early Renaissance or late medieval 
contrapuntal music in the UK. And I think the complete Eden Choir book was recorded by the 16 on Cora, or one of those people groups did it. But here it is. Here's a bunch of it. And it's very, very beautiful. This is sung by Tonus Peregrinus. You've got to have a wandering tone, which I guess is what a Tonus Peregrinus is. A uh, traveling tone or something like that. All right, next, the Missa Conceptio Tua. This is Pierre de la Rue. Pierre de la Rue was a wonderful composer, actually, and he lived from, let's see, 1450-something to 1516-ish. And there's other music on here, too, so antiphons and, and other sacred, sacred short bits, like preludes, if you wanted to call them that, if you were using the later terminology. And then we have, let's see, disc 12. A la me, the a la me re manuscripts, Flemish polyphonic treasures, and they are, they really are. You get music by Josquin Desprez, Pierre de la Rue, Adrian Willard, it's fabulous stuff, gorgeous, gorgeous stuff with the Capilla, the Capilla Flamenca, whatever a Capilla Flamenca is. I love, I love the way these people come up with these names. I still think that Tinnitus Classics has the best of them all, of course, with Musica Urethra. I think that that's completely inspired, and they sh thank God I was able to get that before these people got their hands on it. Because I'm sure, I'm sure that now that I've done it, they're all just sitting there going like, ah, damn, we could have had Musica Urethra. What a pity. Then we have some Spanish, early Spanish music, Juan de An Anquieta. The Missa Sine Nomine. That means the Mass without a name. And a lot of Masses had no names. They were just Masses, and they didn't have a name. The names were usually taken from the musical bases, um, you know, that the musical bases for the material that the Mass used. They could be secular songs, they could be motets or works by other composers, but sometimes they just had no name. This may have had a name at some point. Oh, here it is, by the way. But we don't know what it was because the material that the ma on which the Mass is based has not been identified. Perhaps someone will find it and be able to prove that it, Mass has a name, but until then, it doesn't. Uh, then we have a lovely, lovely collection with the Ring Around Quartet and Concert doing a bunch of Italian frottole. What is a frottole? A frottole is a polyphonic song with instruments. That's all you need to know about it. It's, 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 they're delightful. They were a little bit easier. They're quite pleasant. They existed from, let's see, what does it say here? From 1480 to about 1520 was the highlight, the high point of frottole competition. And if you wanted to frottole yourself, here you go. Knock yourself out. Fantastic. Now we have, I'm already up to disc 15, so we're halfway through. And at exactly the midpoint, we come to Josquin. Josquin Desprez, possibly the greatest composer of his age, and it's his like 500th anniversary this year. Uh, and actually, actually, there is a huge Josquin box that just came out on Warner, and we're going to be doing that one too. That's really, really cool. Josquin and the Franco Flemish School is what that box is. This casts a wider net, and they're complementary. So you don't have to think that if you get one, you can't get the other. You can have both. It's perfectly all right. So we have Josquin Desprez, the Missa L'Homme Armé, his most famous, famous mass, for based on the tune L'Homme Armé, which was the greatest hit of the 15th century. You know the tune, Lam pam pa da 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 you know, that's L'Homme Armé. Everyone knows it. I mean, you know, you go to sleep humming it. So that's on here with a bunch of motets and other goodies. And this is, again, Oxford Camerata. I played a sample of this in our talk on on Dave's handy-dandy guide to do-it-yourself guide to Renaissance polyphony. It's another video. Feel free to check it out. It may help you get to help you navigate the different formal strategies that were common during this period. Next, we have music for the Viljuela. Yes, the Viljuela. What is a Viljuela? A Viljuela is, is, was a Vijuela, pardon me. A Vijuela was a guitar, an ancestor of the guitar, a guitar-like device. 
and the the great vihuela composer was was Louis de Milan, and here he is. And then we also have this other guy, um, Luis. There's another Luis, Luis de de, de Narvaez, Narvaez. And it's really, really nice. If you like loop music, solo guitar music, and all this, this is some of the earliest stuff that exists for the instrument. This was written in the 16th century, the first half of the 16th century, 1500 to 1560, in that period. And it's quite, quite beautiful and, and lovely and beautifully played by Christopher Wilson. Now we're up to 17. See how much progress we're making? Thomas Tallis. Spem in Allium. I did a whole video on Spem in Allium with samples. Go listen to it. This is the famous, famous 40-part motet. 40 parts. Ooh, it's eight, eight five-part choruses, all calling and answering. And oh, it's just an amazing piece. It's incredibly beautiful. And you also get his Missa Salve in Temerata. Can't have too many of those, can we? So yeah, Talus is just essential, and he is he and Bird were the the two the two uh, the what you might call the masters the grand masters of English polyphonic sacred music, and it's it's exquisite it's it's gorgeous stuff just wonderful. Next, let's see what else have we got up oh, Palestrina, and of course you have to have the Pope Marcellus Mass, and you get another one. Palestrina is so famous, he needs no introduction from us. A little controversial today. You know, Palestrina wrote you know, hundreds and hundreds of mass settings, and his music is often considered rather dull because it has a certain placidity to its surface, a, a perfection and smoothness. It's extremely beautiful. But it can be it can be rather tedious, um, not in these performances. Fortunately, uh, you may like Palestrina or not, but you have to include him because with Palestrina, and his dates are 1525 to 1594, we can probably say that modern music begins. He is the guy. Modern counterpoint begins. He was he was. The, the guy who taught everybody counterpoint, what the rules of counterpoint were, the codification of what, of what our music today is or what it became starts here with Palestrina. Not that it really did in real life. It started that way because that's what academics, that's where they said it started. And you have to pick some place. So he's the guy. You could argue, now that we know all of this other stuff that happened earlier, that of course everything he did was done previously by somebody else, and and uh, you know, or there were other people at the same time, like Victoria and things were doing just the same thing he was doing, only better. You know, all of those arguments are possible, but historically, Palestrina was the first composer that the universe acknowledged, the Western universe acknowledged, as as the linchpin of its musical style and culture and tradition. And next we get, ah, someone who's just as good, if not better, Orlando de Lasso. Also, now he, now he changed his name, it's now in French. I mean, he didn't, we did. When I was growing up, it was Orlando de Lasso, the Italian version. Now everyone is calling him Orlando de Lassus. So I have no idea why, probably because he was French. <laughs> it's probably a good reason to to keep the French one, even though he was in Italy, who knows. Okay, so this is his very last work. He was also, he was like Josquin, he was the greatest composer of his era, and his era was 1532 to 1594, or thereabouts. This is the Tears of Saint Peter, Lagrime de San Pietro. This is a set of madrigals but they're spiritual madrigals. They're madrigals on sacred texts, and they are extraordinarily beautiful and deeply moving. And I'm going to play you an entire, almost an entire one of them. Well, the first clause, big clause of one of them. It's called Il Magnanimo Pietro, the Great Peter, and uh, or Peter the Great, or something like that. Uh, and it's sung here by Ars Nova under Bo Halton. Who was really very, very, uh, they're a very, very good group. And this is a beautiful performance of a great work. I mean, the Tears of St. Peter were 
you know, a summing up masterpiece, quite possibly, in as much as we really know. <laughs> and, and you really, you really should hear it. So here is the, the first madrigal of the set. There are how many of these suckers? Uh, like 20 something, I don't know, a bunch. <laughs> That's Orlando de Lassus or Orlando de Lasso, however you want to do it. And now we come to a whole bunch of rather interesting, interesting, different changes in direction in the nature of the collection, because now we start to see the rise of instrumental music. Previously, we saw the vihuela, the guitar. So there was music there, or there was vocal music played by instruments, or or little you know songs and things that could be done. But now we have actual instrumental music written for instruments, and one of those instruments was the keyboard, keyboard of all types. You know there was organs and spinets and virginals and thingies and harpsa harpsa thingers and clava cembal, you know what I mean, all kinds of stuff gizmos and gadgets. And one of the first great composers for the keyboard was William Byrd, who was Thomas Tallis's colleague. And he was an extraordinary composer, of course, generally. And this disc, played by Glenn Wilson, who's an absolute master, contains his complete Fantasias for harpsichord. And this is the shortest of them, the, fan the Fantasia in G minor. It's like 41 seconds long. And it's, oh, it's, it's a, no, it's a prelude, I'm sorry. It's not a fantasia, it's a prelude. And this prelude is extremely preludial. We're not talking about Debussy preludes or Chopin preludes or even Bach preludes, which can be quite highly developed. These are preludial preludes. They're clearly used to introduce you to something else. So here is the teeny tiny 40 some odd second long preludium in G minor. Thank you. 
but instrumental music was born and the genie is now out of the bottle and there was no putting it back. So next, after keyboard music, we go to Gabrielli. Oh, everyone loves Gabrielli. Music for brass, for multiple choirs of brass, written for San Marco in Venice with echoing brass choirs. And it, it is music that is so iconic, so of its time. I mean, you can't like, you can't even hear music that takes place in like Shakespeare's time or something like that without playing something by Gabrielli. You hear that music and you immediately think, ah, you know, the Renaissance, that's it. It was the Renaissance. And it was actually a little bit later than that, but that's okay. This is 1554 to 1612 is when is when Giovanni Gabrielli was around. And here we have the brass of the London Symphony Orchestra, a good old London Symphony Orchestra. But that tells you something. This tells you about the Western tradition of you know our musical our musical heritage because the modern brass section of the London Symphony Orchestra has no problem playing the brass music of Gabrielli written 400 years previously and playing it in a most idiomatic and attractive way. And this is his canzone. It's one of his canzones, which means, you know, song. Song number 16. It's in 12 parts. Yes, that means lots and lots of brass. Oh, God, that's fun. Here's a bit of it. Gotta love it. Everybody needs a disc of Gabrielli. See how nicely comprehensive this selection is? I mean, this box has got a bit of everything. It really does. And it's 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 just marvelous that you get all of this stuff. So there is that. And next we have Elizabethan songs and consort music, which we, I mean, you know what that is. It's vials and people singing about, you know, pain and death because their girlfriend's missing, essentially. You know, John Dowland, that guy, except John Dowland, I think, comes along. Oh, yes, he comes along later. But before John Dowland, we get we get Svelink. Oh, I love Svelink. This is, this is a great keyboard composer. Wonderful. And a choral music composer, too. His, he set all of the Psalms of David in French. They are gorgeous. The complete Psalms. All hundred and some odd of them. Magnificent, magnificent stuff. And his keyboard music and organ music is the beginning of... Organ music, I mean, the kind of stuff that led to Buxtehude and then Bach, you know, that Netherlandish tradition. And here he is. So you got to hear some Sway Lake. It's really, really good music. It's very, very tuneful and contrapuntally intricate and highly developed quite often and, and just generally good stuff. Just good stuff. And then we get John Dowland. We all know John Dowland. I did a talk on Dallin's Lacrime. So you can go see the video on that and you can hear some of it. And it, this is Pavan's Galliards and Almond's. This is lute music with Nigel North, the great lutenist. Fabulous stuff. And of course, the lute music is mostly songs that were simply played on the lute. But Pavan's and Galliards and those things, those are, those are dances also. 
So you get dance and vocal music, essentially, performed beautifully by Nigel North on the lute. This is, I think, volume three. Yes, volume three, by the way. So, I mean, most of these are parts of a series, or a lot of them are. I wouldn't say most of them, but a lot of them are. So if you want to go and explore further, you can get further discs in the series. Smart move, Naxos. Now we're up to 25. Last batch. You ready? Jezwaldo. Now we're up to the period of the madrigal. The fabulous, fabulous madrigal. You know what madrigals are there. You take anywhere from like three to five or six people and get them together and give them a song, usually about love. Of course, it's a song. And, and, and nature and nymphs and shepherds and fawns and Arcadian wilderness and things like that. And they and and they, they do madrigals. Jeswaldo, of course, was famous because he murdered his wife and his wife's lover and then spent the rest of his life hiding out in the castle so that he wouldn't be killed by his wife's relatives. And since he had a lot of time on his hands, he wrote really crazy music full of strange dissonances. And I did a video on Jeswaldo. So I expect you to go watch that one as well. And with some samples too from this from this series, which is fabulous. It's it's Delicie Musique under Marco Longini and it's really first class. Absolutely first class. And so you really you really should hear that. So we've been doing madrigals and lute music and stuff like that. And there's more. There's more. There are lute songs by Thomas Campion. These are what they sound like. Songs accompanied by a lute. And they are usually elegiac in character. And there's a whole big pile of them. There's a lot of these. There are, let's see, one, two, I can't even tell you how many there are because I can't see, but it's, it's a lot. And most of these discs, by the way, are over an hour. There's over 31 hours of music in this collection on these 30 CDs, so you'll be busy. <laughs> Trust me, you will be busy. Campion's dates were 1567 to 1620. So we're getting up there. We're getting up towards like, you know, now. I mean, not much towards now, but closer to now than we were. And one of the guys who got us towards now was Monteverdi who invented Western tonal music as we know it. Well, not really, but sort of. He sort of did. Monteverdi straddles the high or the late, the late, late Renaissance and the early Baroque period because Monteverdi's years were 1567 to 1643. And by 1643, you're really into the Baroque period. That is the era of harmonic continuo, tonal harmony, and accompanied singing with keyboard instruments, you know, we're getting really close to the kind of stuff we're very familiar with in classical circles anyway, like Bach, like Baroque music, right? And this is some Monteverdi madrigals from book five, also with the same people as do who did Gesualdo, the Delizie Musicae with Marco Longini, which reminds me, I owe you guys a talk about this stuff because Monteverdi's madrigals are well, the acme of the entire madrigal universe, basically. And you hear in, in his madrigals the progression from the, the early madrigal style of simple unaccompanied singing to totally accompanied operatic scenes for solo voice and things like that, and scenes for multiple voices and even mini operas. He called them all madrigals. And so we see the evolution of something totally new and wonderful. And we're gonna talk about that. We are, we're gonna talk more about that. Then we have some more English music. Thomas Tompkins, consort music for vials and voices and some keyboard music too. Now we get an entire admixture of voices and instruments. This is his dates were 1572 to 1656. And England, of course, was a little bit behind the rest of Europe as, as arguably it still is, I don't know. I had to say that, I'm not insisting that it's true, but musically they were always a little bit behind. They hung on to their vials while other people had given them up and were using violins and cellos. The English were still clinging to their vials in little groups, in cute little, little, little groups called herds, because as you know, the vial sounds like a dying cow. So they, they called them consorts because it sounded better than a herd of dying cattle. But if you didn't want to say 
herd of dying cattle, you said consort of vials. And here they are. And sometimes you had songs accompanied by them. And here's some of them are. So there you go. And let's see what else we got here. Oh, we're back in Spain. 17th century secular Spanish vocal music. The Guerra Manuscript, or Guerra Manuscript, Volume 1. So there's more stuff like that. This is a collection by any number of Spanish composers, including Anonymous. But there are actually people attached to some of these songs. We know who they are. And they're, they're lovely songs for voice at voices and instruments. Let's see who's singing them here. Well, let's see. Uh, there's a soprano and a harp. You got a harp. Yeah, look at that. Exactly, a Spanish bar bar Spanish bar Baroque harp and soprano. Actually, I was just playing this before I started the talk. These are really pretty pieces. It's, it's a lovely combination and a lot of fun to listen to. So that was very nice. And finally, last but not least, disc number 30, William Laws. Now, Laws was was late English consort music, sort of the end of that tradition. His dates were 1602 to 1645. And this is music for viols, lutes, and theorbos. The theorbo was kind of like a, like a lute. You know, they were all guitar, lute type instruments. And this is music for multiple viols and multiple lutes and multiple theorbos. And they're quite lovely. Now, by now, you have what was called Laws wrote things called the royal consorts, and the royal consorts were essentially dance suites. These are Baroque dance suites, like Bach would do, the Baroque dance suites, like the Bach's keyboard music, the English suites and the French suites. That's what this is, only before. Of course, if you wanted to go to the guy who sort of invented these, the suite concept, at least as far as music history tells us, you have to do Froberger. But you know, Froberger was about this time as well. And here you go, William Laws. And with that, we are in the Baroque period and the early music era is at an end. But as I hope you can hear or see and heard, this is really an absolutely terrific collection. And I'm looking at the stuff here that we got to listen to. It's very, very beautiful music, lots of fun. And, and incredibly varied. And this is just a slam banging collection of it. I mean, you really can have this and you'll have, if you want to explore more early music, then you'll know where to go. And if you don't, then you have a fantastic sampler that will give you really just about everything you need to be able to dip in where you want to dip in and, and check out what you feel like what you feel interested in with with total and complete ease and sensibility and at no great expense in a beautiful sturdy box doesn't get much better than that does it i don't think so so keep on listening folks and go for some early music i mean it's a steal it really is thank you for joining me take care